Hi, welcome to Free Exchange. I'm Howard Wall, the director of the Hammond Institute and of the Center for Economics and the Environment here at Lindenwood University. Uh, today we're joined by uh, Richard Anderson, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Economics and the Environment, and like me, a former uh, Fed economist. So we're going to take advantage of our expertise and talk about monetary policy uh, and the operations of the Fed, mostly after the financial uh, crisis. So Dick, thanks for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Howard. So the first thing, uh, my own view about the crisis, if we can just dispense with that quickly, is that uh, Fed policy during the financial crisis in 2008 was largely appropriate, although a lot of the details are, are pretty gruesome in a lot of ways. But largely, I thought it was appropriate uh, at the time, but uh, that we're not in crisis anymore, but we can talk about what happened after. But do you agree with the general assessment about? I think that's right. The, the, you know, going back to the 19th century, the wisdom among central bankers is if you have a financial panic, you do what you need to to end the panic. And that's what they did. Beginning in August 2007, and then expanded in December 2007 into 2008, the extensive lending they did to the banking system really was necessary to get us through the panic conditions. And then, of course, the failure of Lehman really increased counterparty risk and uncertainty such the financial markets froze up. Right, so now, the financial crisis itself was largely over with by, by 2009. By March 2009. March 2009. And it's, it, it, it's surprising. His, the historical evidence is that financial crises last about six months. The panic lasts about six months and it ends. So by March 2009, the panic that had ensued in the fall was largely over. And the economy was still shedding jobs, but early in 2009, you were losing 700,000 a month. Sure. And that had pretty much tapered off. Right, so, and in fact, the official recession ended in June of 2009. Yes. And then we're, we're sitting there and it's okay, uh, the recession is over, the crisis is over, things are still looking pretty bad in terms of the job market, then the Fed has to decide what to do. Yeah, okay, and what did the, the Fed well, do? Well, really in March, they made a decision that they had the tools and the knowledge to increase the pace at which the economy would return to potential output or full employment. Now, the question... But these were not the usual tools of just fooling around with the Fed funds well, target. Well, already by the end of 2008, the federal funds rate was zero. So you can't do much with that, right? And we know that monetary policy, the channels of monetary policy, in part are through bank lending and bank credit, and are part operate directly in asset markets by changing asset prices, and therefore changing the yields, the rates of return on long-term long investments. So in Ben Bernanke's first press conference as chairman, he was asked a question about whether the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Market Committee, was concerned with the stock market. Mm -hmm. And he said, of course we are. One of the intents of our policy is to increase the value of stocks and the value of the stock market, because that increases wealth, increases confidence, will increase spending, and will increase aggregate demand. And no one thought that was the least bit of a problem. So, Well, at the time, the stock market was probably the at the Dow was, what, 7,000 or it something It lost like half that. its value in the financial crisis, but right. it had begun to recover. It was right. recovering quickly. But the same philosophy applies after that. Since they couldn't reduce short-term rates any longer, they just started buying increasing amounts of long-term securities. Now, on the one hand, you have the banking system, and banks had been burned in the financial crisis. You know, they weren't sure of the credit quality anymore of their customers. Uh, large and small businesses coming to the banks uh, with business plans found the banks less attractive to their business plan. You know, an optimistic forecast before the financial crisis didn't really pass muster in 2009 very well. Right. So bank lending didn't respond very much. But there is the argument that even if the banks aren't lending very much, if you buy enough long maturity assets, you can change asset prices directly in the economy. Maybe the price of houses, maybe the price of a shopping center, maybe the price of some other real estate, and in turn you can stimulate spending by doing that. Now, all of this predicates on there being a fairly strong link between, or a sufficiently strong link between, say, stock prices, okay, raises wealth, and then that, the, right. that wealth effect 
would then lead to spending, and then the spending then spurs the economy. Ab but the, uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that there's, there's a very strong link between uh, stock market wealth, because stock market wealth is uh, it's just a paper wealth, but it's risky as opposed to say, uh, you know, so you're, if you, inc you double your stock market value, it doesn't mean you're going to double your spending. You might have a small increase in right. your spending, right. but it's not everybody's going to have a small increase in their spending because much of the stock value is held in, say, pension funds. Right. And we know stocks are held directly by a very small part of the population. Right. And where stocks are held by households, they tend to be in pension funds, 401k plans. And we also know people don't pay that much attention to the value of these. You know, because your 401k went up $10,000, you're not going to go spend another $10,000 on something else. It doesn't work quite that way. So what are the other kind of long-term assets that they that the Fed might be trying to Well, the Federal you know, Reserve, poster? it's, it's controversial, controversial among monetary economists because the Federal Reserve argued if they bought assets that had any significant default risk, they were really engaging in fiscal policy and they weren't allowed. That wasn't part of their mandate from Congress. So the only assets they've purchased are assets that have no default risk. They're guaranteed one way or another by the U.S. Treasury. Most of those are Treasury bonds, but part of them have also been mortgage-backed securities issued <clears throat> by either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Because both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went into conservatorship during the financial crisis, and hence all of their debt all of their liabilities are guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury. So the Federal Reserve is saying we're... Well, that's a, a different kind of risk-free asset than, say, Treasuries, because you're relying on the mortgage-backed securities not going down, and then you're having to go... Which, then you're having to go to the government, so there's an extra step in between well, but that's, going to, but, then but, holding Treasury bills. But that step's very short, because what the Congress did is agree to fund all of the losses in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's portfolio. So any, any potential loss on a mortgage-backed security, the Congress had agreed to cover. So the explicit promise lowers the risk once the, once, by itself. Once, so. the, once, the, once these institutions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, went into conservatorship, the guarantee that the markets long believed was really there by the Congress became explicit, and they became the equivalent of treasuries. So monetary economists looks at these and saying you're buying only long maturity securities with no chance of default, no default risk at all, and you're paying for them effectively by creating deposits at the Federal Reserve Banks, which also have no default risk. So you're exchanging one default risk-free security for another default risk-free security, and there's a huge controversy about whether that can have much impact on the economy. Well, so that's uh, that's like sterilized monetary policy, right? Very, very, very. You just swap <laughs> one t type of asset for for another. Well, but but on the, but it's, if you're sterilizing, you don't want the balance sheet to grow. So in 2008, early 2008, when they were lending a lot of money to banks, bank lending was growing. Lending to banks was growing very aggressively. All collateralized. There's no risk to the Fed in that lending. But the Federal Reserve was selling treasuries out of its portfolio to offset that effect on, the, on keeping its balance sheet about the same size. Right. And beginning in March 2009, as the economists say, they went to unconventional policy, which, is, which means simply expand your balance sheet and keep expanding and keep expanding and keep expanding until you see something happen. Now, um, so this is quantitative easing. This is quantitative easing. And and I've given various talks in Europe about it. It's interesting, as you, you look at the United States, Federal Reserve, you look at the Bank of England, you look at some other central banks, about 25% of outstanding government debt seems to be what they bought. And you know, Britain, maybe it had more of an impact, maybe it didn't, um, because there's, there's more finance to the banking system. Now, the channel that this is supposed to address is, right, they increased the bank uh, you know, balance sheets, and then the banks yes. are supposed to do something yes, in response I, to that. And I, that's, that's the key, that's the link, right? Where well, the, well the, two major, the two major channels are either that bank lending expands or that in the market you change asset prices directly. And by changing asset prices, you might stimulate uh, investment spending. 
You, know, you raise the value of land or the value of a small shopping mall. Mm -hmm. And that might induce someone to say, well, now I can either mortgage that and build another one, or the business prospects are much brighter for building another one. So you, you hope, but your earlier point should, should be returned to. For households, the idea, even in the research in the 70s and 80s, uh, stock prices, bond prices, had a significant impact on household spending. But in total, it wasn't very large. So the idea you're going to get households to spend a lot more by right. changing stock prices just isn't there. Households, it's probably housing. So again, you're hoping that by buying up, and, and here we come to the tenuous link you started with. We, we, we have this idea we can buy long-term government bonds or we can buy mortgage-backed securities and somehow we're going to affect household spending. And it almost, almost always has to work through the price of houses. Right. right? And, but you know, house prices until recently have moved very little. In right, so although mortgage rates fell dramatically price, to historic price, lows, prices the, the market move. didn't well, pick and, up until and, very recently. And much of it is pessimism. People say, I'm not going to incur more debt, I'm not going to extend my spending because I don't know what the future of the economy is going to be in a year or two. And we tell, teach the students about circular flow. Right? If you're pessimistic and you're not spending, <clears throat> then the next person has lower income. <clears throat> they have lower income, they're not spending. Right? <clears throat> so the whole circular flow process just slows down. The circle just gets a little smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, until you can convince people that they have confidence in the future, but at the same time, we're all lobbying households to reduce their debt, saying they took on too much debt. So how do we get them to spend more while also reducing their debt? I mean, so this conflicting message has been going on for well, the last several years. Well, right, one of the lessons of the financial crash is if you took out too big of a mortgage, or even if you were fairly sensible and house prices right. fell, then you could still be underwater. Well, in St. Charles County, many of the, the houses that were short sales or foreclosures were people who had perfectly reasonable mortgages and then lost their jobs right. in the recession. Lost anyway. And there's very little to do about that. Right. So uh, thanks. We're going to come back after a break, and we're going to continue talking about uh, Federal Reserve monetary policy. Can you help me with this? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Sure. He helps me with homework. That would be 3.6795. Thanks. Yep. He helps me with my decision making. I wouldn't use this one. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. I'm learning so much. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. I've got a job to do today. I've got a job to do today. Don't forget, you've got a job to do today. Hey, Mom. I got the job. <laughs> Thanks. I've got the job. Welcome aboard. Have a good first day at work, Mom. Your donations to Goodwill fund job training programs right in your community. Feels good to start fresh, right? Sure does. And like that, you're a job creator. What do you think it would be like to teach? Chances are, you have no idea. Teachers today are breaking down obstacles, finding innovative ways to instill old lessons, proving that greatness can be found in everyday places, and that you don't need to be famous to be unforgettable. That's what it's like to teach. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. 
That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Hi, welcome back to Free Exchange. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation with Richard Anderson, who is a uh, senior research fellow at the Center for Economics and the Environment here at, at Lindenwood. Now, we were talking uh, before the break about uh, monetary policy and quantitative easing and what that, what that means and how it's supposed to uh, affect the economy, the channels by which it affects the real economy. Now, can you assess how uh, effective it's been in in doing what it was <coughs> set up, what was set out to do? Well, it certainly hasn't done what they hoped it would do. It hasn't been a negative. It hasn't dragged the economy down. Yes. But, but, the, but, <laughs> but the, well, there, there are there are some analysts who've argued that by the Federal Reserve intervening to such a very large extent in financial markets that they've disrupted the usual function of those markets, some of the usual players. And so there's been criticism that, in fact, this, is, this has, has slowed the economy because it's slowed the, the recovery of financial markets. I think that generally that's not true. And there are many, many well, Let me give you an example of, because I'm sort of mm -hmm. one of those okay. who thinks that the Fed has done so much that they've made things a bit worse. Fine. Uh, so the stock market, you said the Fed wanted to, one of the things they wanted to do was to boost the stock exactly. market. The stock market is up to 17,000 or something like that uh, today. And uh, this hasn't led to spending. Now, if you, but at the same time, banks are still holding on to the money that they have and firms are borrowing money and buying back their own stock. Right. Uh, right. They're, they're right. acquiring other yep. things, and, and that's driving Absolutely. the uh, uh, the stock market up. Well, large firms are so, also so it's, you've distorted things so much that uh, firms, instead of borrowing money to invest in machinery, factories, hiring right. workers, etc., are instead investing in themselves or in their own stock prices. So they what could, and so, and so we know large firms have very large cash reserves. You know, we saw firms like Walmart and General Electric selling debt, selling bonds in the market in the last several years, and turning around investing the money in short-term instruments such as treasuries, treasury securities right. and commercial paper. Their view is they don't see profitable opportunities for expansion. Now, as an economist, you can say, well, if, the, if a company's profitable and has significant cash flow, and if the management can't figure out new business opportunities and, and can't be entrepreneurial with it, they might as well give it back to the owners, which are the shareholders, and tell the shareholders, go invest the money in something else. Find some other company that can grow, that is innovative, that is entrepreneurial, because we don't know how to do it. We're just going to sit on the cash. Many of the companies with large cash reserves say, look, we were burned very badly in the financial crisis and we're not going to take that chance again because they found banks unwilling to lend to them. In the, fall, in the, in the fourth quarter of 2008, there was a big surge in bank lending. That came as companies went in and drew down contracted lines of credit at banks. And then that fell off in 2009. The biggest problem has been small businesses. And during, up until the last year, small business surveys didn't cite credit and bank lending as their biggest problem. Their biggest problem was uncertainty about the future growth of the economy. In the last year, that's shifted. More of them now are saying they're finding that they have good business prospects, they have good business plans, but they're having difficulty raising funding. And again, you know, the, the banks say we don't see the business plans coming in that make us optimistic about lending to these companies. Well, so if we accept the premise that at least, at the, at, at the worst, the Fed did no harm, right? then uh, another way to look at it is the Fed was doing all of this, but that the problems in the economy weren't monetary. That there were other problems, yes. Uh, yes. like my own view, horrific fiscal policy, and uh, right. lots of new regulations and uncertainty on the policy side, the regulatory including side. Including the banks. Including with banks including being the banks. Uh, hugely uh, regulated now, right. although they were maybe the most regulated industry before the crash. So to say there's a lack of regulation didn't make much sense. Well, it sense. depends on which banks. Remember, the, the, right. the investment banks were completely right. unregulated a, 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 after Asymmetric regulations. Some were heavily regulated right. and some weren't. Right. Now, so, um, so if we accept that it, you know, there were other things going on. Might that have been the reason that monetary policy didn't work? And the alternative is that it wouldn't have worked even if everything I, else was I, fine. I think we can look to the labor market. 
The big problem the last six years is the number of workers that have been unemployed for long periods of time. You know, the U.S. economy has tremendous turnover in the labor market. You go to Europe, you talk to Europeans, they're horrified at the way the U.S. economy works because in a given <laughs> year, 25 percent of the jobs in the economy will change, will disappear, right. and people will find new ones. As economists, we say this is very efficient. This makes the economy <laughs> dynamics, right. you know, you know, obsolete firms disappear, new firms enter, it's wonderful. But to the Europeans, it's, it's just horrifying. They can't. They can't. <clears throat> but we've seen the last six years is more and more people out of work, six months, a year, year and a half, two years, not just the usual turnover as people quit jobs and look for better jobs or people, new people enter the labor market. That long-term unemployment is, is, a, is a problem. It's a symptom of something in the economy. And every downturn, in every recession, some firms die. Usually the weakest firms die and the stronger firms survive. Hopefully the same thing happened in 2008-2009, right? that the expansion has not drawn back in this, these long-term unemployed, and some of them don't have skills that are in demand anymore. That's the fact of life. Some of them need some, some additional education. Uh, Janet Yellen, now as chairman of the Fed, has said her view is we need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing with monetary policy until we can get demand strong enough that firms basically have to hire these workers who've been out of work for a long time. Well, so let me, let me ask you a, a question then. If, if, you, if one thinks that the problems in the labor market are due to non-monetary things, uh, right. then can those problems be solved with loose monetary policy? Well, there's another controversy. There are <clears throat> large numbers of people who disagree with what I said, saying, if we make, I was being blunt. Well, understand. <laughs> no, no it's, I mean, because when, if you look at individual persons and start talking to people, you realize that there are many, many of these people looking for work. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes this set of six different unemployment rates now. So you go to the largest one, which includes all the workers they survey, who said, I used to have a job. I would like a job, again, similar to what I had, but I can't find it. So I've become discouraged and dropped out. I'm not counted as unemployed anymore. If you add those people in, you're looking at 10 or 11 percent unemployment. Well, and actually a, a kind of a little known bit about unemployment statistics is if you've been unemployed for longer than, if you answer that question for more than a year, right. then you're dropped. Right. They don't even consider you unemployed. Well, they just throw you out even yeah. though you say you're looking for right. work. And the other statistic we've noted is employment relative to the total population over age 16. Before the financial crisis, it was 64 percent. It dropped to 59, and it's been stuck there for the last several years. Right. So some analysts have come back and said, well, there's a new reality, and this is not going to change. The economy is as it is, and the people that are long-term unemployed are never going to get pulled back in the labor market. And 59 percent as the employment to population ratio is where we're going to remain. There are others, including Janet Yellen, who say, no, if business conditions become good enough, businesses will start hiring people that they wouldn't otherwise look at. Some of them will get retrained, get new on-the-job experience, and go back to work. And, and, but it's not a classic monetary policy problem to do that. Historically, in particularly the 1960s when they tried that, there was this very similar view that if we made demand strong enough, all of these persons who, who aren't, I shouldn't say terribly productive, but need job experience, need training, would be drawn in. Well, I mean, that, it, that experience ended badly in high well, inflation. Well, how would you answer, you could criticize uh, uh, the federal government for increasing the cost of hiring somebody, right? So yes. somebody's productivity is lower than it was before because their job no longer exists. So right. whatever they might be able to, to find yes. is, is, is not going to pay as much. But at the same time, right. hiring that worker, now less productive worker, is more expensive than it was before for it things is. that have nothing to do with their productivity. Uh, there's the uh, health care is more expensive, minimum wage is higher, which was increased twice in the middle of the, right. of the recession, and uh, all sorts of other regulations on banking and on firms right. and so on that it's not is profitable to hire somebody. I think that's right. You know, if, if, if a business hires a worker and incurs specific training costs for the worker, 
that's part of business expenses. That's effectively a tax deduction for the business. If they hire a less productive worker, pay them a wage, and they just aren't very productive, that just shows the bottom line as profits. Right. There's very little to do about that. The big problem for businesses, however, is if you hire a worker and you give them experience, you give them training, they very well, very well might leave and go work for your competitor. There's very little way for the business to capture that. And that's a real, real impediment to hiring these marginally attached marginally attached workers. Now, but that, that's always, always been true. That's always, it's now always is that, been is true. Is that part of this worse now be, in this It, it might market. be to the extent that many of these long-term unemployed worked in firms that have disappeared or in industries that have contracted. To bring them into another business, it may be even more expensive. And do you take that risk? You know, do you wait for your, your, your employer to take that? Just this morning driving in, again on the radio, there's another story uh, about retraining programs through the community college you know, that are government funded. And say, so, you know, if you've been out of work a long time, you're probably eligible for this set of benefits. You know, please come and check. Please apply for this program. Because then the employer doesn't incur the direct cost. But despite having many of those programs, many of those programs go wanting for applicants. We, right. can't, we, can't, we can't get people into them. Uh, I think that's the only way out. You know, to, to think that monetary policy can be sufficiently expansionary long enough. We've been six years at this quantitative easing, and we've only gotten a little ways with it. I'm beating a dead horse. I think, I think, yeah, and <laughs> What's I th the definition and, of insanity is doing the same yes, thing over and over. And yes, and the, and the Federal Reserve has an enormous balance sheet now. They're going to have to sell or, or, or wait, for, wait for them to mature off for about $3 trillion in assets. The Federal Reserve has never been in its history in the position it is now, and how they're going to unwind this. Well, I the Fed no is, uh, they've been saying for years that they're very confident that they can handle it. Well, they're very confident. But <laughs> I'm sure they, they are very confident. Well, they're confident, more, well, as we know, being in the Fed, <laughs> the public statements you make express sometimes more confidence than you actually know internally, right? Well, it's, it's, it's not confidence, it's the ratio of competence to confidence well, that's you, really important. Yes, you, you believe that when, the situation comes, when the time comes, you can figure out a strategy that will get you out of this mess one way or the other, right? So you say, I'm very confident that I can figure it out when the time comes. Well, thanks, thanks Dick, for joining us. And let's, let's hope that the Fed uh, can figure this out. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching. This has been Free Exchange. And we've been talking to Richard Anderson, uh, who is a senior research fellow at this uh, Center for Economics and the Environment here at Lindenwood. And if you want to check out uh, the Hammond Institute and the Center for uh, Economics and the Environment, you know, just Google it already. I don't have to tell you how to do it. Thanks. Bye.